is Antoine, and I want to talk about the views of error. Uh, so I work in DigitalOcean, and I have crazy ideas about sailing the world and getting rid, getting rid of all my possessions. Uh, so this is a rant about errors. Um, a lot of people say things that I would like to correct a little bit, because that's my opinion, but I want to share it. Uh, people say don't use font error f and export all your errors. So I just want to talk about that. I say it's complicated. Uh, so don't, exporting errors for no reason. Um, when you export errors, it's part of your API. Uh, I say you should try to keep your API titty and tiny. If you export all your errors, then you're not doing this. So when you export an error, you should like know why you're doing it, and not just do it because you don't know better. Uh, export your errors if and only if you have a proven use case of what you're gonna do with that error if you catch it. Otherwise, just return an anonymous error that's not exported. Uh, and your exported errors, you're, you're not gonna need them anyway, most of the time. Abusing errors. Um, some people like to reuse errors that are de defined in other packages, like instead of returning a Boolean that says, I don't have this thing, they return OS error not exists. Um, I think it's much simpler to use an API that just says, I don't have it than trying to switch on errors. So I think that's an abuser of errors, and it's easier if you don't do that. Avoiding font error f. Um, so a lot of people are saying that every time you use font error f, you're hiding the original error. Um, so when you don't use it and you just return straight up the errors that you get, in the end, if you log your error, you lose context about what happened, say you return you receive an unexpected EOF, that's not very useful. This is much more useful if you bubbled up your error with thumped error F. Um, so yeah, you lose the original error, but most of the time the context where your error happened is more important. And in some case, you're going to figure out that you actually care about the original error, and then you can refactor that path. So yeah, don't overthink your errors. Don't export by default, keep your API titty. Uh, don't use errors to return non-erroneous con conditions. Until proven otherwise, just bubble your errors with font uh, ARF, and then when you discover a specific case, undo it. Keep it single, simple, yegni. Blah, 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 la fin. I'm Prakriti, I'm here to share with you all my first experience working in Go language. I decided to participate in an hackathon conducted by our company in December. That is where I got uh, hands-on experience in Go language. So this was how we spent 24 hours with Go. Um, the agenda of the, of the hackathon was to create a completely working app in 24 hours uh, based on the concept which was thrown to us uh, in the beginning of the hackathon. Um, so while working through the app, we have followed some of the methodologies like, um, uh, that was the first time I ever wrote the API, but still I felt it was really easy. And since we are from Rails background, we followed the file structure. We actually built our file structure similar to that of TDD, sorry, MVC. And we are from, um, uh, and we do believe in, um, uh, we strongly follow TDD, so we have, we ensure to write test cases before building any functionalities. Uh, so for, to, uh, for hacking for 24 hours, finally we came up with an app and we named it as Marga. Marga, a path towards a better city. If no one is from this country, I would like to explain what Marga. Marga means in Sanskrit, it's a path. So Marga, basically the, um, the basic idea of the app is to build uh, build a social application where people can post their issues and the users of the app uh, to communicate that issue to all the users, including the social uh, employees. But the best part of the app is that um, anyone can take an initiative to come forward and resolve the issues. At last, what they gain is social respect. Um, so at last, I would like to show how the how our app was built. Means the demo of the app. Yeah, this was Marga. 
And this was our um, registration page. Uh, we have given um, a phone number and password for the login credential since it is easy to remember. And when the yeah, when they fill the uh, credential, they'll take into the um, they'll do, take into the landing page where we can see the crystal of issues. This indicates the issues in a particular area. When a user zooms in, he'll see the flags. These are the particular issues uh, in a particular area. When he click on the flag, in, um, he'll take into the detail page where he can see the detail of the uh, particular issue. The best part is he can comment on a particular issue. Like, um, yeah, we, t okay. <laughs> fine. Okay, um, so uh, he can come. He can comment on that issue. Like I too had the issues, and we can get together and resolve these issues. Um, then we have uh, we have given the categories. Like um, there are many categories um, where we can go and uh, post the issues, and there is a option called my complaints where I can go and view my complaints. Yeah, that's it. Um, this talk was special for me because this was the first time I tried Go, and this was the first time I wrote API, and this is my first Go conference, and I'm really totally fresher to the Go, and thanks for, for supporting. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Praveen. I'm a developer at Quinix. Today, I want to talk about home automation uh, using Android or iOS devices. Uh, with the help of Golang as a backend code and Raspberry Pi as a device that is an interface between them. Uh, at the time, it's like I always wanted to create a home appliance device that can control the uh, devices like uh, lights or bulbs in my room. So at that point of time, I was new to Go, so I thought, why not start something in Go? So before starting something uh, which is uh, controlling the hardware appliances, I wanted to get few components which can help me uh, finish my project. So these were the things that I selected. One was Raspberry Pi, few diodes, LED bulb, breadboard, relays, switch, and DTH11 is a uh, device to get the humidity of the room. And this is the uh, architecture kind of thing that we had planned to uh, build the project like. So it's like I have a mobile application, which is uh, iOS or Android device. And that will call my Golang API. So part of the APIs will be in the server, and the other part will be in the Raspberry Pi. So this API will be pinging the Raspberry Pi based on the Raspberry Pi's ID. And uh, it can be one or more Raspberry Pis placed in uh, different rooms. And uh, the each Raspberry Pi will be connected to uh, the home appliances that you want to control. So the reason why we chose Raspberry Pi is uh, it is portable, really simple. And it has close to 40 GPIO pins. So out of the 40 GPIO pins, I can use 18 GPIO pins to connect home appliances. So it was like an interface or the brain of the uh, actual project, uh, which will give an interface between my Golang API and the devices, home appliances in my case. So this is the Raspberry Pi. And on the right edge, you can see uh, there are close to 40 pins. And out of this, 18 pins can be used to connect to the home appliances. So I can connect probably eight to nine devices using only one single Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is the view of my mobile application. Uh, you can see at the le uh, left-hand side, I have a UI where I select each room, and it will give me the temperature and the humidity. Initially, it will be zero. As soon as you select the particular room, it will give you the temperature of that particular room. And uh, on the right-hand side, we also have an option called lightings, where right now I have given the pin number. That is the pin number of the Raspberry Pi. You can customize it based on the device that you're connecting to the, those particular pins. So on the click of each pin and uh, click of the button, it will call my Golang API in the server, which will call that particular Raspberry Pi. And it's like a switch. So for further enhancement, we wanted to control window shades and uh, also use live streaming for security purpose. Uh, that could be AWS uh, video streaming or something like that. And we want to control more complex devices like AC, or something like that. So yeah, this is what we did. Awesome. Uh, I'm here to talk about streaming with Golang. Uh, basically, talking about streaming, we yeah. 
basically talking about streaming, we usually use YouTube, Dailymotion, etc. And there are plenty of others too. Here I'm about to talk one such application which we have built using Golang and which basically deals with uh, AWS Elastic Transcoder and it is specially built for iOS devices. Our app uh, does not only focuses on streaming. Here we can record videos, stitch them, rearrange them and upload it to the cloud and we can use that for uh, streaming purposes. We have, for streaming purposes, uh, our app actually uh, converts this, I mean, uploads this video in MP4 format, but usually this MP4 format is not uh, suitable for streaming on the cloud. So we usually convert this format into MOV using AWS uh, Elastic Transcoder. Elastic Transcoder is a transcoding service provided by Amazon. It helps the developers to convert the videos into, uh, into suitable uh, video formats which can be played into smartphones, tablets, and PCs, etc. This is an overview of the AWS Elastic Transcoder which has been used in our application. So initially when, <coughs> the initially the recorded videos are uploaded into S3 bucket, which is in the format of MP4, and a pipeline is created where the transcoding job is done. Here actually the MP4 format is converted into MOV, and this in turn is saved into output S3 bucket. This out, uh, the, the MOV format video which is, uh, which is stored in the S output S3 bucket is used as streaming video on the iOS devices. So here's our application. This is called RVD. Uh, as I said, this deals with recording, rearranging, stitching, and uploading videos. Uh, coming to our app, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we usually go on road trips. We usually go in groups. When we go on groups, we usually take videos we individually take videos when we want, we want to make it as a short movie. So we can use this application. I, as a user, I can start a show and I can become a director and I can invite my friends to contribute their videos into my, into my show. So after this, I can take these videos, rearrange them and I can upload them on this, uh, upload them on the cloud and use for a streaming purpose and it can be uh, used for social purposes, and uh, it can be a pri private video or even a public video. And there's a small video of that. So this is where uh, we create our show. So once we create a show, I, if I create a show, I'll be a director of it. So this is where we record our cameos. So here I can rearrange the videos as well, uh, uh, in the order what I want and then I can merge this video and this becomes a short movie. Like this. All right. Hello, good morning everyone. Yeah. Good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Pratik. So I just want to talk about my application. It's a woman safety application written in Golang, so I just want to pitch the idea just. So what we are doing is uh, get the instant help as early as possible. So what we are doing, just um, uh, there are many apps like uh, getting instant help, but most of them have created the group. From group, uh, they already contacts. And from that contacts we get, like our family. So instead of that, what we are doing, we just search the one kilometer area uh, from, uh, the person location. Uh, All right. uh, person location. And send notification to them. And if they reply, then they can get the instant help from them. So that's the basic concept about it. It's a complete open source app. So anybody interested into contribution, they can contribute. My GitHub ID is Pratik Dhanwe. You can check there. So um, anything more about the Android part, we'll tell Prasanna. Uh, hello, I am Prasanna. At the first time, user will get registered. After that, uh, when uh, if a woman says that I am in trouble, she will uh, press the button. After that, uh, after that, her uh, location will be sent to the server uh, via push, notifi uh, push notification. 
After that, uh, her notif notif uh, uh, location will be sent to other devices via push, push notification. So that uh, she will get uh, help uh, very, very uh, uh, fast. That's it. Uh, I just want to thank to Sachi Stalin sir and Gautam sir for providing scholarship for Google. That's it. Thank okay. you. All right. Okay, since we are setting up the laptop, I have uh, three very special people here. Sidhu, Niranjan, Ajay. Okay, you all have probably not seen them today for most part of the day. Uh, these are the co-trustees for the Emerging Technologies Trust, which organizes these conferences. And Satish, he's uh, unfortunately he's not available uh, for the, he had a last minute cancellation. But today, the announcement is for three of our special guys here because today Gojek just acquired both their companies. <laughs> so, and there was a press release this morning because of which they were so busy. But uh, guys, well done. We're really proud of all of y'all. And uh, you know, no, no treat, I'm sorry. <laughs> party. <laughs> Big party. <laughs> All right, so thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Good. Right, uh, my lightning talk is about stream and share with Go. It's not related to WWW. It's a simple local stream and share with Go. Uh, this thing is my first experience with Go, and I'm hacking on various number of things, and I'm messing up on various programming languages. So I actually had two problems. Uh, one was I got my new computer, so you might ask me that why a new computer might be a problem, but the problem is still on the way. So I got my new computer and I was very much excited to use it and I was traveling on the way and I was still thinking like what a way I could transfer all my old stuff that is backed on my other laptop and I could transfer it to the new one. But I was still thinking on it and I was very much excited. I was on the way to my home. I opened up my new laptop and this is this. So it's a new USB-C type. So nothing is compatible, right? So I need to again go to the Apple store and I need to get the USB new type one. So that was one problem. And the other problem was I was a movie freak and I wanted to stream my movies, right? So, so that thing I used to, uh, I used to see a lot of movies on my mobile. Uh, even if I'm on home, even if I'm on home, I used to use my lap, uh, mobile to watch movies as it has booming experience like I put on my ear pods. So, so the second problem, storage almost full. So I was wondering uh, like how I could do all these things so as I am more uh, comfortable with Python, I was doing lots of stuff with Python. The most Pythonic way is use a simple module, simple HTTP server, and host it. So that thing, uh, I faced a problem like large file should crash my server, used to crash my server. So then I met Go, and I wrote a very small code, like I used the HTTP, net HTTP package, and I did HTTP dot file server, and I uh, served the entire directory. So, boom, my problem is solved, and everything uh, I got it on my all the local stuff. I shared it using my Wi-Fi router, and everything is on my way. And even I could stream my high-speed uh, movies. I watched my fantastic movies. So, and surprisingly, Go was really awesome for me. And the most best part was when we had a party, uh, I used to plug in my hard disk. All my friends used to watch different movies. Like uh, I used to host a small HTTP server. And my friends, one used to watch one movie and the other used to watch other movies. So that's my best experience with Go. So go, go. How, how was it a party? <laughs> Everyone's watching their own movies, man. <laughs> Everybody was a movie freak. OK, so what I'm going to do is uh, basically uh, comparing the concurrency. So concurrency is uh, one of the feature of the Go. 
unless maybe we can compare it with other languages. So this is, has been started because one of our product has 21 billion API hit per day. So it is pretty huge and we are number one, number two is Google. Okay. So for that, that has been written on PHP and it has been written like a 2006-2007. So we need to rewrite it. Okay. Now we find out three major uh, languages who can deal that that level of a skill. Number one is number one was the C sharp. Number two, we look into the Node.js. Number three was the Go. So C sharp, we keep it out because it was Windows and it won't run on Linux. Now let's compare the both the things. So I have a huge uh, benchmark comparison of this. Some basic I will cover right now. So this is a bubble sort. Here is the PHP code, typical PHP code. Here is the Node.js. So anyone can see and uh, can tell me it can it could be written better, obviously, but it's, let's say it's a basic one. Similarly, here's the Go. And here is the comparison. <coughs> so PHP is obviously like uh, anything, OK? And Go is okay doing best. Now comparing the Go and the Node, Okay, so I'm not uh, good at. So when comparing Node and Go, so uh, we find out that Go was near around 50% uh, faster and double faster than the no Node.js. But what about the static uh, from the static pages from the HTTP server? So on that part, basically uh, we did this simple code, uh, just sending a static file. And what we identified is, uh, both where Go and PHP was uh, again uh, very uh, not very good, but Go and the Node.js were very good at both ends. Now, what about the scaling? So once we started, uh, once we started uh, giving like a thousand requests, uh, what 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 happened actually is Go was very fast. Go was uh, almost ten times faster than the Node.js, but it was only for the one thousand. As soon as we go for the ten thousand, the scenario revert, and it was the Node.js who was performing a lot better than the Go. Now again, it is only for the one server, when we take the near around, uh, comparing it with the 10 server, the situation revert. Now the Go, with the having uh, 52,000 requests per server was better than the Node.js. But again, when we increase the load, it was the Node.js who was performing the better. And why it was happening, why, why the Node.js were able to perform better than the Go, Maybe I can t uh, tell you later on the back end, if anybody is <laughs> interested. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Thank you for keeping on time. And next we have uh, Gaurish. Do you have? So I'm going to talk about AWS Lambda and Go. So uh, first of all, a little about me. I work at a company called Punch, and I'm pretty new to Go. So the problem I'm going to discuss is that we had a scaling problem with our servers. So we use an email provider which pings us with each of the email. So if we send an email, they'll uh, as soon as it gets processed, we'll get a callback from the provider. If, if it gets opened, then also we'll get a callback. So uh, for each email, we were getting multiple. And what ended up happening was that uh, we would have uh, scaling problems and our service was going down again and again. At NIT Goa, so as I'm in college, so mo I am having most of the free time. So I thought let's do something with it. <laughs> as I've already wasted like one and a half hour of my, one and a half year of my college. So I thought of making a website because I have an idea and I thought of implementing it. It's like a ride sharing platform. So I started with Golang. It was introduced by my brother, uh, my elder brother. He told me about Golang in the last year of June. So uh, I started making that website because um, the language that I knew before it was only C and C++. So it was hard to come up with that, uh, making the website with that C and C++. And I tried Java also, but it was too complicated by that time that I had a hard time to even uh, start it. So I went with this Golang, and uh, I have made this website. Uh, it's, uh, it's called as cut6.com. You can go ahead and check it. We have already deployed it. 
um, there were many problems in this. So I also referred to my one of the senior uh, fellow in the fourth year, and we together made this website. So special thing about this website is that you can share your ride. You can um, post your ad if you are going from one place to another place so that other people can also join you. And the special thing about this is that you can also um, give your own path. You can select your own path. Like in the Google map, it is uh, you can select your own waypoints from which way you want to go. So that is all about it. Thank you. Just to let you know, Aditi, there are a lot of there are a lot of companies as well as organizations support. If you all require anything else to take that app to the next level, you got to talk to a few companies. They'll be more than happy to support you or sponsor you on these things. Okay. All right. We are up next, Gaurish. Okay, so I'm Gaurish, and uh, I'm from Jaipur. I work at a company called Punch. I'm new to Go. And the specific problem I was talking about was that we were having scaling issues. So our email provider sent, it with, sent us with an email webhook, and that was so much slow that our server used to go down. So I discussed it internally and said, we have a server problem. How do we fix it? I said, OK, let's just uh, come up with a new architecture for this. And uh, what we'll call this is a serverless architecture. So we won't have any servers, so we won't have any server problems. So basically, we don't have any servers to monitor, configure, or update. And uh, this might sound a little bit crazy that we want some servers, but no servers. So the way this works is AWS has a service called Lambda, where you essentially upload your code and don't think about the servers which they run on, and you pay on uh, per request. And it supports uh, Node.js, Java, and Python. But wait, this is Go, GopherCon, so where is Go? Now, this is where we uh, come up with this thing called uh, Epix. It's a tool uh, written for managing AWS Lambda. It supports Go with the Node.js shim, which basically uh, runs uh, the binary inside the Node subprocess. And what I did was that I uh, wrote a webhook for this. So that will listen to all the events coming from the email provider and then uh, process them for later use. And this is open source, by the way. So if anybody wants to look at, it's available on my GitHub page. And this is the structure of project JSON. So basically, we say this is the name of the project, then some description. And this actually does like two things. One is proxy unsubscribe events. And second one is log all the events to S3 for little analytical usage. So we put them into Redshift for that. And then uh, runtime is given as Go, and timeout is 10 seconds. And this is uh, the main Go program. So the magic that you see is here in this handler func of Apex. So it gives us the event, which is the parameter coming from the HTTP API. And the return types are this, uh, which is the interface and error. And here is the rest of the code. So what we basically do is three things. First, we uh, decode the JSON. Second, uh, we uh, check if there are any unsubscribe calls in the proxy. And uh, third part is that we upload that to the server. And once everything gets done, we say it's all OK. And that's the message. Now, for deploying, it's very simple. We say Apex deploy a webhook. To test it, we say Apex invoke and also get the logs. So the learning is that Go on AWS Lambda works. It's effortless scaling. I'm able to scale it to the millions of requests without any problems. And uh, it's really cost effective. It's almost free because you get wow, 1 million requests per month. And thank you. That's it. There are the links if anyone wants to look at it. Uh, you really thought I was going to come and push you out. <laughs> Ah, I was, I was. All right, so uh, next up we have uh, Arya and Ashwin. You got the mic? It's on. Hi. Um, so I'm Arya and I work at Adobe Labs. And so we have this go back end and a lot of PHP as 
got them to C, so uh, they had to run on the back end, so the solution was to use C Go. So uh, result, uh, after my one and a half months experience with Go, now I have an MP3 decoder or an MP3 encoder all of them deeply wrapped up in C Go and working with a bunch of other DSP algorithms and back end concurrently. So uh, yeah, so that's how I, I've started liking Go and I can see what concurrency can do to some uh, real uh, DSP operations like read a short time code to transform or an MP3 code or a HEVC, how, how well it can be written using uh, concurrency in Go. So DSP and concurrency would be something I would like to explore further and they should keep me ex uh, experimenting with Go. Hi. Oh, one, one sec. If you want to clap, clap hard. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ashwin. I work at Adori Labs. Um, I don't have a PPT with me right now, but this is just to share my experience on making the transition to Go. Um, let me tell you, if I may, that I come from a JavaScript background. Um, I've been using Node.js for close to a year, for as long as I can remember. And it was only recently, last year, December, when my friend and colleague, Kartik Rao, who just gave a talk today on Golang benchmarks and performing, he introduced me to Go. And uh, I would say the transition has been really good. And uh, I've since then been writing APIs, um, using Go SQL drivers, and Coming from a dynamic uh, language to a statically typed language was a really good experience. Go seemed really friendly, and uh, I'm really happy that I made the transition today. And today I'm a happy Go user, and hopefully someday I might be a Go contributor as well. Thank you. Yeah, making open source your livelihood. That's so good to be. Yeah, before. Going into how to how do we make this uh, as a livelihood? Uh, let me recap uh, what made us uh, think us to do this. What is open source? I hope uh, everybody knows what is open source. If not, uh, then you are in a wrong room. You might do go and attend the HQ interview. <laughs> uh, uh, then we were thinking, why do people contribute to open source? Is it just a it, it does give kicks to them. I mean this kick, not that one. Or is that to build their profile? And I want to ask, uh, do you guys, uh, do you folks contribute to open source? If I s what is the reason? Is it uh, the kick or the building a profile? So how can we make money only from uh, open source work? Working in a company which pays for open source contribution or consulting uh, the <coughs> through open source uh, profile, uh, writing a pro uh, blog, books, and podca podcasts and sell them. Uh, without any reward, uh, the people tend to lose interest and lack of commitment, and they get other priorities, then this gets lower priority. So have you ever rewarded the uh, open source work by donating? Anybody rewarded? OK, nobody rewarded this side. So how to reward the contributors? So how to encourage others to contribute to open source? So we are uh, making a platform uh, which can uh, reward uh, the open source contributor. But for that, we I need to take a survey. So I would request all to give a survey on this link so that we request any questions from other Thank you. Thank you very much on this uh, URL. I'm queued again. Thank you. Okay, since there is there's like about uh, 30 seconds left, a little more about this. This is uh, an idea that cropped up about how we can actually see if we can bring in the dreaded vitamin M and open source contributions together. So if you'll have the time, if you'll have a chance, when you get bit.lycurriosity,
code dash curiosity. Give it a shot, take a survey, it's all free. We're not charging you for it. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Edu. And uh, Salim. We have been investing a lot of years in getting hold of the concept of processes and files. These are the two basic concepts in Unix. But uh, this has changed in CUS because of containers. We now have to deal with namespaces, I, I, uh, IP addresses. We have to think about how to mount volumes. And they, this brings a lot of overheads onto developers. And Project Atomic attempts to solve those problems, not only for developers, but also for people who are sysadmin who are DevOps. So product, Project Atomic is really just a combination of these four things. It is Nullicule, which is really a specification of uh, defining multi-container applications. Uh, the so-called uh, popular microservices, uh, which depend on one another. Uh, second is atomic host, where these container-based application will eventually run. Third is uh, a developer bundle, which a developer will install on his machine so that he doesn't have to deal with uh, how this application will run on a production machine so that that containerized uh, thought process is out of his mind and he can totally focus on his application. And uh, finally, the IT, ID integration, like integration with Emacs or Eclipse or IntelliJ or whatever. Uh, the way how it works for a developer is we provide a Vagrant box, a Vagrant virtual machine, which has uh, support for Docker, Kubernetes, behind the scenes, and a user only creates a Nullicule file, which is a uh, specification file, how to combine these multiple services. Uh, we'll take an example of uh, MariaDB and WordPress. Uh, I mean, we usually uh, uh, use WordPress for blogging, right? And it requires a database. So how we compose it, like a user has to spe specify this Nullicule file with the dependencies for WordPress and MariaDB. And optionally, he can also specify how these are going to deploy, how they are going to deploy on Docker, Kubernetes and OpenShift. And that is all the user has to do, that's all. Uh, and after the user does all this, in the atomic host, he runs atomic run. And the application deploys on all, all three platforms, Kubernetes, OpenShift, and Docker. Uh, this uh, project is open source. It's uh, sponsored by Red Hat. And you can go check it out and contribute. So right now, uh, this project is mostly written in Ruby and Python, and we are in the process of rewriting it in Go, most of the part. Thank you. All right, uh, and the last speaker of the day, Apurva and Kashish. we use Golang in Gage. Let me tell you what is Gage. Gage is a test automation tool. It is open source. It's very lightweight. It's cross-platform. And it also has multi-language support. So it has multiple languages right now. Gage supports Java, Ruby, C Sharp, JavaScript, Python, and many more coming up. Uh, we would like to share a few thoughts on why we chose Golang as the language of choice for implementing this. Uh, I would also like to mention that uh, when you write test, why you basically functional test, uh, why you need to follow a particular syntax or something, you can actually, how, how would test be if you can write it as simple as an email? Okay, like in a natural language? Uh, yes, with Gage you can actually write your test in Markdown. So it's as simple as writing an email as such. So, and underlying code you can actually write in language of your choice. So, we'd like to share a few thoughts on what are the reasons behind choosing Golang and how it helped us. So, first thing, Gage is a command line utility. So, I would like to say that uh, Golang is a, is a good choice for command line utility. Why? Because uh, with Golang you can actually cross compile your uh, utility so that it's very easy for deployment. With this, uh, the process becomes simpler. And we also use a few features of Golang, like concurrency, uh, 
many other powerful features like uh, interfaces. We would like to share a few of them. So, so when we released this uh, product, Gauge, so users came and asked us, you know, we have long running tests and you need to provide a mechanism where I, we can actually re reduce the execution time. And so we thought of implementing parallel execution in Gauge. So uh, what we thought of is obviously Golang, so r Go routines and channels. So what we did is, so we take uh, tests and divide them into groups. So let's say uh, we have 10 groups and we'll provide those one one group to one one Go routine. And th that's how we implemented the parallel execution. We released it and users were happy. But we knew that there's one drawback in that. And that is, you know, uh, if one group uh, runs really fast and another group is running really slow, that is like if it takes two hours more, then we are not uh, reusing the full resources. So what we did is, you know, uh, let's say we have 10 groups or 10 tests. So we'll start uh, five, uh, five Go routines and uh, pass them five tests. And when they're finished with their one one test, we'll pass another test. Till, till then we won't do anything. So that's how we implemented parallel execution uh, seamlessly. So uh, Gauge is an open source project, so contributions are back welcome. So the URL is github.com slash getgauge slash gauge. So uh, you can support the issue if you, if you find any, and you can contribute to uh, getgauge. Yeah, thank you. No, I will, I will close your talk in a much better way. Okay. I like my code so much that I cover it with a layer of Go. Okay. <laughs> all right, and uh, we have one last minute speaker. Yeah. Uh, Hi, guys. Sachin, yeah. all, Sachin. all yours. My name is Sachin Sharma. I will not take even two minutes of you. I will not have any PPT or anything. I will just share my goal and experience. So we... Like when you say Golang, the first thing comes to your mind is Go routine. Like how this is concurrency is there, it will make your program fast. The first thing like we did one, we came across through one test that was we were testing the level DB, how it would, how fast it would be for us. So we inserted around like more than one million records in the level DB, and it was taking like one one and a half hours to cover that, to insert more than one million records. And we just to use the Go routine, like just put the Go in front of that function. And it took around 15 minutes only to insert 1 million records. So that's the beauty of Golang. And just, I just wanted to share this experience with you all guys. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks a lot for day one. We begin tomorrow at about 8.30. And I see that there is quite a lot less crowd. So please tell the rest of your friends we begin at 8.30. But we'll begin at 8.30 tomorrow. So see you tomorrow. Thank you so much for day one.